All right, good morning. Thank you for joining us. This is Seeking Sustainability Live number 61. Today we have uh, Richard or Rick Grimm from Image Mill Studios and he does so much exciting work with sustainable brands and building, building company brands in a sustainable way to show the ethical and meaningful and good for people, planet and profit work that they're doing. So thank you so much for joining, Richard. Thank you, JJ. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for inviting me on your wonderful show. Oh, it's so great to have you here. I think um, we're going to have so much to talk about. Can you start by just introducing yourself a little bit? Okay, so my name is Rick Graham. It's totally unpronounceable, but uh, I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland. I've been in Japan for 14 years plus but still completely lost in translation. My Japanese is actually getting worse year by year. It's, it's, it's a bit embarrassing. Um, I founded Image Mill, which is uh, Japan's first sustainable ethical branding agency. Uh, we're definitely the leaders because there's no one else doing it. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been working in advertising for over 30 years and uh, uh, basically got very disillusioned with the whole consumer branding world and uh, decided to do something about it and create an agency that has a, a bit of a different angle. Yeah, I, I enjoyed watching your TED talk. Yes. And yeah, in, you. in your TED talk, you talk a little bit about growing up in Belfast and your family being activists. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, so I, I was born in 1969 in, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and that actually was the beginning of the modern troubles. I don't think it was my fault, but uh, it all began in 1969. So I grew up through, you know, it was, it was kind of a war zone, but, you know, it wasn't that bad. You know, we had a normal childhood. However, there was a lot of political unrest, and uh, my family were very involved in the peace movement. My father was one of the heads of the uh, civil rights movement. And uh, it, my aunt's sister won a Nobel Peace Prize. So growing up, um, you know, I had these great influences and uh, role models. And uh, even from an early age, I was carrying all these placards before I could read, stop the war, no violence. So we were very much peace people. So. Growing up, um, it was very natural for me to become an activist and to, yeah, speak out about oppression, whether it's social, political, and later on, uh, commercial. We'll talk about so many of your interesting and meaningful projects I think you're doing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what you introduced in the TED Talk? So you were talking about monkey mind. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's something interesting. So, um, so I, I I went to art college in Scotland, and uh, you know I was I was busy wanting to be a sculptor, and decided, um, you know, there's there's not much of a career in that. So I became a graphic designer, moved to London, worked in corporate identity and packaging design, and uh, then I, then I moved to South Africa, and I was working in advertising there for um, about three, four years and big advertising agencies before I started my own first agency. And, you know, back then I was just, you know, I was, I was, it was weird because I ended up in Johannesburg, South Africa. And growing up, I was a member of the anti-apartheid movement in um, Northern Ireland. So we were very outspoken. Um, you know, I was making posters about Nelson Mandela for my high school projects. And uh, but finally, when I got to South Africa, I was just working in advertising and I just felt like I would kind of sold my soul a little bit. Um, I was uh, a little bit disillusioned. And I, I just at, at the beginning, I just thought, Shogun, I uh, you, you have your daytime work that pays the rent. And in your spare time, you can do something that is more self-fulfilling. Um, but working in advertising, you soon realize that you don't have any spare time whatsoever, working all nights and weekends. So, uh, you know, literally after nine, ten years, I, I stood back and realized, you know, I'm not giving back anything to society, really. I used to 
meet people and say, hello, I'm Rick. Um, I convince people to buy stuff they don't need. <laughs> so I just thought that was consumerism. That was, you know, that was branding. And, uh, you know, even during the day, I was boycotting certain brands that didn't align with my principles. I mean, the Aries were boycotting stuff before it became trendy to boycott. <laughs> like, uh, we were always looking at brands and government messages and, and never believe anything, maybe too cynical. But um, so with advertising, I, you know, I was literally boycotting brands and then helping during, during my work, the same brands to communicate and sell more products. So yeah, I got a little bit depressed and I Aww. decided, right, um, an ex existential crisis, you know, and decided to sell my company and escape advertising, get out, get out of it. So um, I sold half of my business in South Africa, bought a four by four and started driving up through Africa. And this was kind of my first attempt at dealing with good causes. So I kind of got together with um, a South African charity that takes care of AIDS orphans. So at that time, AIDS was just a massive pandemic. Everyone was talking about it. Um, and I just thought, right, you know, if there's, if there's any charity or any cause that is more meaningful at that time, it would be children who've lost their parents to AIDS. And in Africa, that was a massive issue. So I created this great presentation, you know, and went around some of my old clients and new clients to try and get sponsorship to raise money, funding. You know, and I thought it was a no-brainer. If people saw this, they'll just want to help out, you know. And it was a real eye-opener. Um, I was kind of shocked at the reception. Um, you know, if you're asking for money for causes, people have a real deep suspicion um, that you're maybe you've got an angle or, you know, and, and literally people, clients I knew would kind of be very standoff and, and not, not help out. I was really shocked. I thought I would earn tons of money with my communication skills and give it to these AIDS orphans. So that was kind of my first um, exposure to good causes and, and how difficult it is for people out there who have NGOs or to, to raise funds. Uh, but anyway, so I did that that expedition anyway, and it took nine months driving up through Africa, um, you know, spending a lot of time in nature. Um, you know, it was it was pretty wild, life changing experience. So after that, I went to India, and uh, you know, I was still trying to find what am I going to do? What what's what purpose am I going to find for my life? You know, advertising just doesn't work. I don't want to be part of it. Um, let's, let's do something else. So I spent another nine months in India doing yoga, crazy kind of uh, meditation and all these kind of old yogi practices. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was difficult as well, um, you know, ups and downs. And it was there that I learned about the concept of the monkey mind. And um, it's, a, it's just a great way to categorize, I think, how our mind works. Um, you know, most people, we all aren't really aware of how our mind is working and we just kind of accept that it's us, that it's, you know, it's, you know, it's me, it's my mind, you know, I got to listen to it, I got to react to whatever it says. You know, we even think that maybe some of us think we're psychic and we have great insights, but actually it's just this monkey mind that is kind of a database of memories and past experiences. And it's just trying to help you survive by categorizing all new experiences according to your own past history. Now, this can be very useful, um, learning languages or other things, but it can also trap you in these patterns of negative behavior. So, um, you know, uh, so really, if we could be just come aware of this monkey mind and actually, you know, listen to it, Hear what it says and then make a, a decision based on reality and now whether that's a good good advice or not you could, it's really a key to happiness and to fixing all the problems in your life you know and it it sounds easy but it's probably the hardest thing to do so and hard yeah yeah you know i was doing meditation practices and actually to be quiet to do nothing 
to is clear to clear <laughs> your mind is so hard yeah, right it's, it's almost um, i don't want to say almost impossible i mean i think we can all do it and we can all it's just like another exercise you know it's something that we should put into our lives that yeah we go to gym keep in shape a little bit but you know what are we doing for our minds you know you know we don't have to run off and become monks uh, although that's a great experience um but you know we can just walk through nature do some art do a bit of yoga but it's so vital, I think, to to work on yourself like that mm -hmm. before you can start helping others. Actually, you know? yeah, for yeah. sure. I we also traveled around India a lot, India and Nepal, uh, for quite a few months in between our time in Japan. And I did a, a bunch of yoga and meditation sessions as well. And something that I always thought, oh, I'm I'm pretty chill, I'm pretty relaxed. And then when they tell you. <laughs> clear your mind of all thoughts like just try not to think of anything and then the thoughts like you said um thoughts from the past or creative thoughts are allowed in because your mind is usually so busy with other thoughts um that's really interesting i never thought of it as the monkey mind but yeah it, it really is it's it's naughty you know um it's it can really help you but it can also really cause so much trouble you know the in buddhist philosophy they talk about the mind as being like a wild animal you know if it's trained you can plow your field like a, a big oxen but if it's if it's if it's not trained it can literally kill you as a wild beast you know yeah. so we got it we got to train that that monkey mind you know yeah. somehow and <laughs> i'm and still working on it <laughs> yeah no it's it's so hard and it takes work and it takes concentration it, the the yeah. idea of being in the moment, mindfulness. I mean, how many times do you go through your normal routine or drive to your normal commute and you get there and you're like, how did I get here? I don't remember doing it. You know, and that's our busy lives just taking over into automation. We're, so, we don't want to live like that, right? Uh, exactly. We're, we're just missing out. Um, you know, it's, we're, yeah, mindless creatures walking through life. I do it all the time as well, you know, even missing train stops. You know, our minds are so preoccupied that we're just not enjoying our lives or looking for great opportunities in the now. Yeah, you, so, you actually did a really interesting event called Alt Yoga. Can you yes. introduce that to us? So Alt Yoga, um, you know, yoga, I think, is a really great gateway. Um, I'll, I'll just talk about my first yoga experience in India, actually. I went to Rishikesh, which is where the Beatles went in the 60s, and, um, you know, a really great um, retreat up in the mountains of the Himalayas by the, the Ganges. And uh, it's a very spiritual retreat area for Indian people. So I went to do my first yoga class there, which was really quite a, quite a step for first class. And uh, got up really early, four in the morning, went into the yoga sh temple shrine, and uh, they did stretching for about literally about two minutes. And then they, everyone sat down in Lotus and s just sat the whole morning. So by lunchtime, I was going crazy. You know? So <laughs> I went up to the, um, the guru and I said, I think I'm in the wrong class. And they went, what, what do you mean? He says, I, I wanted to do the yoga. You know, this is obviously the meditation class. <laughs> and he just kind of laughed and went, you know, this is yoga, you know. Uh, yoga is all about quieting the mind and you know learning about yourself. And I says, but what about all the the stretches and the poses? And he went, that's just to make your body ready to sit for long periods of time, you know. So in the West, we have this idea of yoga being this exercise, you know, when actually it's just a gateway to your mind. Mm -hmm. So, so that, I think, that's so true, isn't it? Relax yep. your body. And your mind will be able to relax too. Our body is holding so much tension and yep. stress. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about your projects. You one of the interesting projects you did was in Tohoku. Uh, was that with Peace Boat? Yeah. So that was the time of the big earthquake tsunami. Um, I was based in Tokyo. We were all just sitting working, and you know when things started falling off the table, I realized it was something pretty serious. So um, I, I mentioned Maria Currigan. She was my, she's my aunt's sister who won the Nobel Peace Prize. So 
she introduced me to Yoshioka San, the founder of Peace Boat, and she actually nominated them for the for the uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. So she was kind of my link to Peace Boat. So I contacted them and said, look, is there anything I can do? Um, you know, we've got I've got filmmaking, branding skills. Can I help promote or help raise funding or whatever? So I went on one of the very first buses that went up with the volunteers to Tohoku. So really early, it was, you know, around about a week after. And, uh, you know, it was still devastated. So, you know, um, you know, I think that that's just where I think volunteering is one of, you know, I kind of skipped from Alt Yoga. Alt Yoga is all about creating three principles for life practice that I believe can make life better. And one is, um, you know, buy ethically. And we can talk a bit more about that later. Second is to volunteer for a good cause. So I, I think that's vital in our lives that we should all look for something that resonates with us, um, whether it's feminism, whether it's, it's, you know, Black Lives Matter, whether it's, uh, you know, it has to be something that's key to yourself and find the cause. You know, either get involved with an NGO already doing it and volunteer your time or at least set up a direct debit to help them out. So I think that's a really key area in life that we all need to find that cause. So so I went to Tohoku and used my own skills and advertising and branding to make just a short film that they used for um, fundraising. You know, they played it in New York and, you know, it just really helped show what was happening on the ground. And it was it was quite an incredible experience. We arrived there and we were camping uh, at the local university. It was freezing cold. We were lying at night and we could still feel all the, the aftershakes and the tremors. And then we were going in, in by four by fours into into these devastated areas and cleaning up, you know, and talking to the locals, you know. And, and I think that was one of the main things that, you know, the army were doing a great, more efficient job, perhaps, and really tidying up. But just people going there and, and helping and connecting with the locals just really, really helped, you know. And that, that's what I love about Japan is that, you know, they have this volunteering spirit and people really will, you know, jump. As long as there's an accepted cause, they will all jump on board and help out. So... Yeah, an amazing experience, and I really kept in touch with Tohoku and made an NHK program, anniversary program, a few years back and went back up to see how people were doing. And still people are suffering, so that's that's what really bothers me the most is, yeah, we all help whenever it's, it's a big thing, but afterwards there's no follow-up. You know, there's a lot of depression, suicide rates are high, People are still living in, in temporary housing at this stage. So what can we do to keep connecting? And yeah, it's, it's still a problem and it's not receiving any media attention or news, newspapers up there. So doing this uh, kind of documentary film and having it shown around the world, I see this a lot, right? Like it's not getting attention in Japan you do this beautiful film and it gets a lot of attention abroad and <laughs> then it gets attention in Japan, right? This is yeah. often the way. Yeah. So part of your skill set, you know, part of my skill set, a lot of the people in this series is because we are connected to the outside world to bring interest and kind of soft power from the outside world into making positive change in Japan. I, I really saw this in this project. Um, and many other of your projects, I think. Um, if you're interested in, in seeing this, you can see this on uh, Image Mill's YouTube channel. And uh, it's, it's worth watching. Is this the entire uh, film? Or are, you this looking, are you looking at the trailer for Zan? Or, uh, yeah, no, or, no, yeah. this is the Ishinomaki Tohoku one. Oh, OK, still. yes. So yeah, it was just a small teaser. And, okay. you know, I've got so many, so much footage and always had an idea to create something bigger. But, you know, we that's that that didn't happen. But uh, even, we, we used, even, we used that, a lot of, even that teaser is is yeah. really worthwhile watching and and <laughs> highlights highlights that the problems are, are still around. Uh, let's let's talk. Let's go back a little bit and talk about your your business philosophy. 
and yeah. your your mission because I think that's it's very unique in this day and age but very important to talk about yeah sorry I love going off on tangents no <laughs> no me too <laughs> so anyway so um yeah, so our, our mission, you know, just read it out, is to build and promote brand cultures of sustainability and ethics, working together to create prosperity for all. So there's a lot to be said in that. So, you know, I really think it's up to brands and businesses to change the world. You know, um, NGOs and good causes, you know, they're, they're really vital. They kind of put a spotlight on these causes or you know, negative impact on nature or whatever it is. And, you know, I love them and really want to support them. But they usually don't have the communication survey or the, the funding or even just the time to really reach out to wider audience. Um, governments, um, you know, I'm, I'm from Belfast, so I'll try to be nice. Um, but, um, you know, they really have short term strategies, you know, keeping voters uh, business interests. It, it's it's a tough job for them, um, you know. And I, uh, you know, I really don't see any bad people in government or even in big bad businesses. You know, it's just people with, you know, certain objectives, and usually they're between a rock and a hard place. So, politicians, I think, have a really tough job balancing everything. So, who's going to make these big changes? You know. So I really think it's it's business and branding. Um, and, you know, I think traditionally the businessman was always like even in a tribal sort of context was always like a kind of very influential person in the community who really did a lot to keep that community together. So I think businesses need to kind of reconnect with that responsibility that because they're making money and uh, creating uh, wealth within the community they need to kind of give back to that society and that community that they're in mm -hmm. so um, my business ev is missions evolved a little bit recently I think sustainability is not enough anymore I think um, it's a great start and in Japan it's still behind the curve here so yeah we really need to push sustainability but this kind of negative approach of of creating as little impact as possible, I think is kind of a bit outdated and a bit negative and a bit, you know, it's not exciting. And I think we, what we need to do is move towards a more regeneration approach. And that just means by just the nature of doing your business, you're, you're giving back, you're adding to the social or environment, you're adding to, yeah, the envir environment at the same time. So, now, why should businesses do this? Um, you know, it's prosperity for all. I always talk about, you know, when I'm doing lectures, especially to Japanese companies about sustainability, they worry about it costs too much. But actually, number one rule is sustainability of your own business. You know, you can have the most amazing brand in the world. You buy a bar of soap. I always talk about bars of soap. Can a bar of soap change the world? And, you know, you buy that and a kid goes through school in Africa brilliant but it's going to be too expensive so it's not going to work and just fail so business survival making money is really important it's number one for business but then how does your business impact the consumer also is getting much more aware now and expecting more from their brands and starting to realize that their purchasing power is should be reflective of their own philosophy so that's dangerous for big businesses who are not taking these causes and ethics into consideration. That's so lose. true. And as a, a sustainability focused consultant, I always hear that. It's, yeah. it's going to cost too much to make that change. Well, <laughs> it actually, it's too costly if you don't make that change in terms of branding because it really affects your brand. And to regenerate a brand once people lose faith in it, that's costly. That's going to cost you a lot to try to get that back. And we know that consumers are looking for sustainable brands and more ethical brands. So if you can, like you say, put that into the work that you do with services or products, that's a win-win. It might okay. cost a little bit more, but it's worth it down the road, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in this modern time, um, manufacturing processes everything has been um liberalized and and, and you know 
Uh, anybody now can come up with a great idea and do crowdfunding campaign and make it happen. So businesses are in a precarious kind of time that if they don't make these changes, someone else is going to jump in there. Um, a good example is Tesla. You know, out of the blue, they just decided, right, it's time for electric cars, you know. And, you know, the, the industry had a roadmap of 50 20 to 50 years to make this happen and they were going to move towards that and uh, they thought they were in control but then you know Elon Musk jumped in and just revolutionized the market there and yeah. saw a big gap and the consumers wanted it exactly so really good example I mean Toyota they <laughs> they they had you know they did a great um you know the Prius is awesome and it's yeah. like kind of well, but, they, you know, they invested all their eggs in one basket, which is hydrogen. So yeah. it's it's a whole different ballgame. I could talk about that forever. I yeah. have a Tesla. It's my dream car. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's true. let's talk about your 1% for the planet collaboration. I think that's it's, so I, so, it's part of your principles, right? Yeah. So through that campaign, Alt Yoga, you know, I, I was trying to figure out a very simple process of how to a better world you know it's typical advertising speak and marketing i did a marketing degree at night class you know, long after i had been working in advertising and i used to laugh the 12 steps to a creative advertising you know print ad and i was going that's crazy there are no steps you know in fact throw the steps out and you know, it might come up with a better creative however we've all been kind of educated this way to create steps and it it's just a nice way to kind of get people to kind of think. So I was thinking, you know, find yourself as number one, buy ethically as number two and support a good cause. So, um, sorry, what was your question? What About like a, uh, your collaboration with 1% yeah. for the planet? So, so I also can apply this to branding and companies. So our 1% was the support a good cause. So as, as a business, um, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to start a whole cause or, you know, create a kind of campaign or, you know, create some program that's giving back to society. So Roller joined an organization like 1%. And 1% was started by the founder of Patagonia. And it's really a commitment to donate 1% of your turnover to an environmental cause. So it's really simple. It's still quite a massive commitment when you consider its turnover. You know, and for a bit for bigger companies, that's very difficult. But Patagonia do that and more themselves. So it's very easy. You join it and you pledge your one percent. And then there's NGOs on the same platform, which have all been vetted by the one percent community. So you know they're they're good and above board. And you literally just pick one. You look through them all and say, and they're all categorized in nice ways. You can look at ocean, forestry. Um, ice caps, whatever you want, and pick one, pick the NGO, and donate your money directly to them really easy. But that's just the first step as well. So I was looking through all the Japanese NGOs, and I saw the Japan um, Nature Conservation Association, NAX, NAXJ. And uh, I was looking at them, they're very established, over 50 years old and doing amazing projects. And uh, it was there that I saw the project in Henneco. Um, so they were focusing on the Jugon. And I was actually really shocked that I never heard of a Jugon before. Um, I always thought of myself as being you know, a, a botanist and a you know, marine biologist I wanted to be, but I hadn't heard of a Jugon. <laughs> I heard of the manatee, but the Jugon were really, you know, uh, just uh, in big danger in Henneco. They say there's only about three or four of them left that they identified. And, uh, you know, dugong are just the most incredible creatures. They, like, they're, they're almost so peaceful. They live symbiotically with their environment. They just eat seagrass all day. And um, seagrass is, um, you know, it's, it's under threat because seagrass has to grow in a quite shallow water so that the sun can get through. And so it's kind of flat bays that they grow in. So all those bays have been filled up and developed. And there's only a few left even in Okinawa. And one of the best ones where these dugongs lived had been claimed 
to build a big marine U.S. marine base on top of it. So I was just completely shocked. You know, how, how can this be happening? Uh, there's no press coverage. Um, nothing's really been talked about it. And the locals have been protesting for over like 20 years about this and no one really knows about it. So the 1% allowed me to connect with this great cause and also go further and create um, a film. My film's called Zan. And uh, yeah, I can maybe go into Zan. Yeah, now let's, detail, let's talk but, about Zan now. But, you know, 1% is just a really great vehicle, I think, um, for, for any brand, any business to get up and running and start getting active and, and becoming a good cause. And then you can use that 1% icon on your brand or your product. And it's just a really clear way to show that you care. Yeah, um, I think third party so certification is definitely a great step forward because like we were talking about before, there's so much skeptical you know, consumers yeah. who can't really trust. I mean, because there's greenwashing, because there are companies that aren't being truthful. Um, so having third party like the 1% for the Planet organization, which is checking and vetting everybody, um, so you can trust them more. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You Let's, know, because yeah. yeah, there's some big brands out there even doing their own internal certification because they can't step up to the fair trade mark. And, you know, for me, fair trade is just like a first step. You know, that's just making sure that those farmers are getting a decent wage for growing your produce. You know, so it's for me, it's a really beginning. So it's very disappointing to see big brands out there who are refusing to do it, you know. Yeah. And uh, consumers becoming more and more aware. So the third party accreditation, I think, is really it's perfect, you know. We're registering for B Corp at the moment, which is quite a challenge. And B Corporation for me is the future. It's amazing, but it's really difficult to do. And uh, you know, and I think it's too early for Japan at the moment. So one percent, I think, is the way to go. Yeah. Well, let's so, let's talk yeah. about um, Zen because that you uh, talked in the TED Talk about how it almost bankrupt you. <laughs> but but it has been uh, one of your career moves, right? It has yes. been a great, great project. Please uh, yeah. introduce it for sure. us. So Zan, I, I talked briefly about how I became aware of the Jugong and the, the situation in Henneco. So I, I spoke to them and said, OK, I'm giving you the 1%, but I want to do more. I want to make a film with you guys, you know. You're doing incredible work, and you're just not letting the mass market know about this, you know. Well. They were trying. They're doing their best. They do workshops, and they're they're doing better than most NGOs. But the power of film, for I'm very well aware of, you know, through advertising, and you know that's why that Tohoku film is quite short. The you know the attention span these days is so short that people need that quick message in an advertising punchy way. But I decided to do a feature length for this one because it was just such a big topic for me, and in many ways, I kind of really. Um, you know, saw kind of some similarity with what was happening back home. Um, Belfast, Northern Ireland is kind of controlled by London, um, part of the UK. So our, the government was very detached from what was going on in, in Northern Ireland. So uh, it's the same in Okinawa to a certain extent. Um, they're under control by Tokyo and a lot of Tokyo rules and Tokyo politics that don't really um, make sense down there and the locals are being completely ignored there's a complete consensus now to stop the base building in okinawa and the people have voted the governor has said we don't want it and the tokyo government have just ignored it and proceeded um you know there's there's a lot of reasons for that and i again i'm not going to say anybody's bad there's a lot of international relations happening and relationships with the US government and you know it's it's a lot of it we don't know what's going on however if you just focus on nature and the dugongs um, you know I think everyone can agree that we should protect these beautiful creatures yeah so and you, Hannah, Hannah, and you yeah. had a bunch of screenings of it is it available online so, anywhere or so actually um we decided to go with um united people which is a distribution company in tokyo and japan 
and they're, um, they're a great organization. They organize social screenings. Um, you know, we, we did do a couple of um, cinema screenings, but and we've been really, yeah, um, but it's been really difficult. Um, cinemas are, uh, you know, they're having a hard time as well getting people in. So in Japan, documentaries are not that popular and don't draw the crowds. And political documentaries, even worse. You know, if there's um, a slight sense of criticism of the government, it's really, yeah, you're kind of an outcast. You know, it's like uh, uh, activists in Japan, traditional activism, you know, are really the nails that stick out that um, people want to hammer in. And to become a true activist in Japan, traditionally you had to become, just give up modern society and become like an artist fringe you know, a person and, uh, you know, give up so much, sacrifice so much, you know, to be an activist. So it's incredible, actually, these activists in Japan who are down in Henneko, a lot of them are from Tokyo, give up their jobs, move down there, and they've been protesting outside the camp the of the, the gates of this um, U.S. military base every single day for, like, years you know yeah, it's incredible that you know? is it's incredible and the the motivation to keep going even when they're not making any progress i just yeah. you know my heart was broken when the first day that i was filming there um i saw and it's mainly elder people because activists in japan um you know i think you get so sucked into the whole salaryman culture and doing business that you just don't have time for yourself or a cause or anything else plus you're so worried about how your external activities could look within the company and you know it's not like you'll get fired but there's a lot of un, you know unverbal communication to kind of just play the game and be like everybody else so a lot of the activists done in Henneco are all retirees so they're all elderly people, you know, there's 90 wow. year olds there, you know. And so much respect for them. It, it looks like you had a screening at Patagonia as well. Yeah. And so, so Patagonia, are, you know, have been an amazing support. They actually helped give some funding to the, make the film. So they have like a, a fund where they, they help out NGOs, help out causes. Um, you know, as part of their 1% commitment, it's, it's really incredible. So mm, behind yeah. the scenes, Patagonia are, you know, really helping out these amazing causes, you know, yeah. so they, they give, they give us funding. So they're part of the film. Uh, well, they're, they're very hands off. They let us do what we want and they don't want to interfere, which is, which is incredible as a brand as well. They want the cause to speak for itself. So, so we did a, a one of our first launches at their, um, Shibuya headquarters. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just such a big fan of Patagonia. You know, they practice what they preach. They've Definitely. been doing this a lot longer. When I first started making that film, I was thinking, right, I need to put the Patagonia logo in frame and, you know, really help them out because they're helping me. And I was quite surprised when they said, no, we don't want our logo in it. You know, it just looks like we're sponsoring it. We don't want to look like that. It's incredible, you know, the kind of support that they give. They so, really, yeah. yeah, they they are one of the few companies that I always mention because they are so active in practicing what they preach on every level from how they encourage their staff to be active outdoors and active volunteers to what they do in store, what they do with their products. So, yeah, definitely big fan. I mean, so to be a sustainable brand, I think that's so important. You know, you mm -hmm. can't just look at a target market and go, OK, how do we communicate to them and come up with a slick advertising campaign that talks to them. It's, it's kind of borderline greenwashing or, or full on greenwashing. You yeah. know, the brand and the business has to become part of that community. Mm -hmm. you know, it has to, it has to be a core value yeah. for it to be effective. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so back to Zan, you know, um, that day when I went out with those activists in the morning, you know, I was literally nearly crying because it was all these old, ladies and men, they link arms and sit down outside the, the gate and block the gate. You know, activism is very unusual in Japan because it's it's very much in a partnership with the police and the government. They have permission, the police are there, they block the road. It's like a ritual. And then they let them do their protest for 30 minutes. 
and then they come and they pick them up and pull them off so it's like this theater every morning and for me it just seems so futile that you know nobody even sees this or knows it's happening yeah. but you uh, you helped for them to be seen around yeah. the world you were at uh sundance and other festivals around the world right not, not it didn't make the sundance no. but uh we, we we got you know we got a claim in over 14 festivals around the world you know so you know, you mentioned briefly there about going bankrupt. Yeah, we, we invested so much time in this film that we forgot we weren't making money out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but it was one of the best things we ever did because it really showed that we believed in what we do. Um, it became a massive PR for our company. So doing good, properly core of what you do has so much benefits to reap beyond any measure of the money, you know. So uh, yeah, we won all those awards. We learned so much about, you know, filmmaking, the long form. You know, it was just a win-win situation. Completely. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, we could talk about that the whole time, but I really want people to get an idea of all the diverse projects that you've done. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about your Instagram page. I'm really interested in how you lay things out and you show <laughs> the brands um, on the Instagram. It's so beautiful. And you also have your sustainable life hacks series going, which I really like. Uh, do you yeah. want to talk about your Instagram page and some so, of the products there? So social media is just, you know, it, it's just been, you know, an incredible journey for us. Um, you know, I've been doing branding since a long time when, we used to come up with a TV commercial and a print campaign. We'd spend so much time and money on it, produce it, and then, you know, disappear and wait for the client to come back the next year and make another commercial, you know, and that, that's how long, you know, branding life cycle was, you know, but now with social media, it's just, you know, it's instantaneous. It's it's constant back and forth. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've become you know, kind of social media experts and uh, helping brands to navigate that world, you know, and, um, you know, it's all about doing things quicker, you know, it's creating an impact, you know, working with influencers. So our Instagram, you know, the, 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 the page that you're looking at, the feed is kind of like a, a portfolio page, you know, we want to just showcase our best projects there, um, create a bit of interest, but it's on, um, the, um, the, uh, the stories channel is where we kind of do that regular contact now, you know, so we're constantly showing behind the scenes, you know, when we're making a film, we're out, you know, showing how we're making it, you know, it's a really, it's just a great way to kind of show what's going on behind the scenes. So, yeah, I mean, so for instance, some of our clients now, like Shuamura, they literally have given up all other media and only do Instagram, you know, that's just the power of that media now. So I really enjoy it. I have fun. You know, I love I love doing it. You know, we we've worked out how to cut big pictures up in Photoshop and put them in there. It's 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 kind of easy. We we embedding videos, etc. So we're just kind of experimenting ourselves so that we can kind of help brands do do that do that themselves. You know. But yeah, yeah Instagram. It's, yeah. it's really interesting, and you've um, done f a work for Lush. Um, NHK, so, a real variety of, of products and brands there. Yeah, so um, that's what I love about my work is that we get to touch so many different industries and there's always so much learning happening. You know, we, we really get in touch with so many what drives products, how you make products. Um, but, you know, the, we, that's why we can bring common themes into everything. Uh, so, for instance, NHK. Uh, we did some journeys in Japan series, and that's basically introducing Japanese culture to foreign, foreign worlds, you know, through NHK World. And that, you know, that was just incredible. You know, we went to Sado Island. We also went to Ishinomaki and did a series there. So we're always bringing in these themes of sustainability and reconnection. I mean, that, that's a really key for me is that reconnecting. Uh, as a society, we're so disconnected from ourselves first we're so disconnected from our families even in japan uh, we're so disconnected from nature um you know we're just kind of lost in this commercial world you know that it's it's very unwholesome 
So yeah, we, we try to bring that theme through in all our media just to reconnect with nature. And even small, it's not all big companies. Like you have a, a restaurant called Blue where you introduce a sustainable seafood and... Yeah, so um, yeah, I think that's, that's, you know, we really try to have a variety. You know, obviously the big brands is where the, the big the, the budgets are. But we, we love to kind of take that budget and then do some more um, kind of our personal work. So that project actually was in collaboration with Greenpeace. Okay. So Greenpeace um, wanted to introduce the concept of sustainable fishing to Japan, sustainable fish. And uh, it's a really tough job to do that because, um, first of all, you can't buy sustainable fish, fish in Japan there's just not, it's not been imported. So even if we change kind of mindsets, there's not really, unless they're locally catching, the ma majority of fish on the shelves in supermarkets is all from commercial fishing. So anyway, so that was, um, you know, how do we introduce these really hard topics to the public, especially in Japan? Everyone is really averse to negativity um, and to shock factors. So a lot of NGOs out there are kind of failing because they're sh using shock tactics, showing factory farming, showing, you know, the abuse to animals. And although, you know, I'm a vegan and I think that's a massive problem, I, d I know it doesn't help to show people that or hardly talk about it. So we got to be positive and show, you know, how can we change our lifestyles and enjoy it and, and you know, and be healthy. So that little blue restaurant was just a great example of somebody who cares, um, a chef who decided to create a little restaurant and, and create amazing food <laughs> foremost, that really delicious, really taking ideas from, you know, you know, even fish and chips in England. He took that concept and made these, inc you know, it doesn't look anything like the fish and chips we get back home. It was like a work of art and taste of <laughs> Oh no. Oh no, you're frozen. Oh dear. Uh, he's frozen. Hopefully he's coming back. Okay, you're back. Yay. Oh, sorry. I you left. froze for a second there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I was talk talking too much. That's no, no, you, cope, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so interesting. So anyway, you so, broke it. <laughs> so for me, so for me, that kind of mini documentary approach is a great way to you know, communicate these values and these sustainability practices, you know, so, you know, and that's what I really want to do is create films, but you don't actually know it's for a brand or Greenpeace, <laughs> you know, Greenpeace is there at the end, but, you know, it shouldn't be about them. It should be about some subject that they hold valuable yeah. and it should be more packaged in a way that's interesting, entertaining, oishi, kawaii, <laughs> And uh, that and, was just a good And example. your your brand is so good at pulling the connections with people and storytelling. And that yeah. that is the power of brand building and mm -hmm. uh, being able to brand build with stories and people in a sustainable way is really fantastic. So I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. You also yeah. have, uh, you were a speaker at the consulate with the Ireland ambassador, is that right? Yeah, well, you've done your research. You know. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm actually a director of the Irish Chamber of Commerce. So um, it's, it's, it's a small group. Our, the Irish Connections is not that big in Japan, but um, we're doing, doing good work. And yeah, so, uh, you know, my first introduction to them was I, I did a little mini TED Talk, our introduction to sustainable branding, what's it all about to the Irish business community. And um yeah, and also last year I actually won an award as the Irish Entrepreneur of the Year in Japan. So developing Congratulations. business. So so yeah, I've been I've been it was really nice, and uh, you know the ambassador's great and really interested in you know developing the sustainability ties, and you know Ireland is the Green Emerald Isle, and um, you know and there's a lot of lot of um, sustainability and ethical practices going on. Um, you know, I, I'm a bit, I'm a vegan, but um, you know, if you're going to eat beef, eat Irish beef because it's grass-fed. You know, um, the the cows are well taken care of. 
you know, you got to you got to start paying more for these things. So, yeah, we're helping international trade between Japan and Ireland. So. All right. Um, let's switch to your Vimeo channel a little bit. Um, of course, being a beautiful videographer and media artist, you would be on Vimeo. It's a, a yeah. great place for the creatives to be, as well as YouTube. Uh, you had, uh, looks like a short documentary called Signs from Nature. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it, we've got kind of distinct areas of our own business. So one is obviously working with big brands and businesses. Uh, another one is helping NGOs out, you know. So, um, you know, helping them just up their game from a, a, like a communication point of view. Um, but, you know, they still have budgets and uh, 350, um, they commissioned us to make a film about um, climate change. And uh, I don't know if you know who 350.org are. They're like, I mean, they, they kind of came out of nowhere, but they're amazing. Um, they're, they're very brand savvy, international NGO, totally committed to, you know, fossil fuels and climate change. And uh, in Japan, they're a small, small setup. And... Um, you know, they were thinking about how do we take this kind of 350 um, philosophy and uh, get get the ball moving in Japan. So we had a lot of back and forth and talk talking. Uh, they wanted, you know, we, we wanted to do something very impact and very strong like they're doing overseas. But I kind of helped them to step back a bit and kind of package it totally differently. So what we did is we decided to make a series of different short stories around Japan about how climate change is here and now because we often think of climate change as something long in the future something far away in the antarctica or great barrier reef but it's really affecting us here and now um so we were up in hokkaido and we did a nice story with a fisherman who actually because of the reduction in the amount of fish he actually you know he was seeing this he decided to go into kombu production and he find out that kombu production now i'm re i'm a bit dyslexic so numbers are really bad for me but there's been government testing and over the last 50 years there's been a dramatic reduction in the amount of kombu being produced oh. due to the temperature increase in the ocean and that's for a couple of reasons one is other algae start growing as when it gets a bit warmer kombu loves really cold water and can survive and, and flourish in it but as soon as it gets a little bit warmer, other seaweeds start appearing and they block the sunlight to the ah. baby kombu. Mm -hmm. And another another reason is uni, um, the uh, the art sea urchin. Mm -hmm. They actually have a feeding period in the summer where they come alive and they start eating kombu, baby kombu. So because the, the warm water is, is, is lasting longer, they're eating longer. So there's actually a lot more reduction. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was a brilliant story about, you know, kombu, which is like a staple diet of Japan, is under threat because of global warming. And so that's the, what we're trying to do. The crazy thing is how seaweed cleans the water, right? But because the water is getting so warm, some of the most uh, sustainable types of seaweed cannot survive. It's Everything is so interconnected. So basically, you went from Hokkaido all the way to Okinawa, sharing stories about how uh, the climate is changing. And I would love to see it. Is it available anywhere? So um, again, uh, this is kind of going the social screening route. So right. anybody can show it. So if uh -huh. you just approach 350, okay. um, they've got a few rules. Um, you got to have five people or more. Um, you got to do a little presentation at the end of it with their showing about what, how to make action. And, um, but it, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a good way to kind of have a few friends over and talk about it. Eventually it will be released to the public. We're just trying to figure out when to do that. That's great. But, we're uh, we're running just... short on time, so I'm rushing you to the next yeah. project a little bit. I <laughs> love this project you did called House Vision. Okay, so House House Vision. I mean that that wasn't my um, project. Um, that was a big project for um, uh, a famous designer in Japan created that. But I, I made it just a small documentary about it. But for me. And for Monocle Magazine, I don't know if you know Monocle Magazine. So Monocle Magazine is a really great 
um, uh, lifestyle magazine from the UK um, and uh, really hipster Bible. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I was making all the films for Japan um, for them, online films, little documentaries. So House Vision was a great project that was basically getting together big brands and architects and creating a showcase for their homes of the future. So there was a big sustainability angle there about how maybe future homes are going to look like. And Muji even did a house there and it was all, you know, sustainable and ethical. So great, great event. Uh, yeah. And But we, I just did the, the film to but, cover that. But yeah. beautiful. You did a, a beautiful job showcasing all the different artists and, and architects and, and designs and tech and yeah. stuff. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So, so for me, that's, that's really the way to communicate. I mean, like um, um, innovation, I think, really appeals to Japanese market as opposed to um, uh, activism. <laughs> you know? um, so innovation, I think, is the best way to show how we can use technology and how we can use new practices and new ways to kind of uh, combat these issues. So House Vision for me was a, a, a perfect way to do that. Yeah. So I know it's not one of your core projects, but it's great to show that your company has done so many diverse projects with different companies and different brands. We have just a few more minutes. Can you talk about current or future projects? Okay, sure. So. <laughs> It's a big ask, I know. Yeah. So at the moment, um, we're working on an amazing project with Citizen Watches, actually. And they have a ProMaster uh, range of watches, which are outdoor watches. So normally they do these kind of commercial films showing maybe world champion climber or these kind of really great um, overachievers or explorers, etc. But I, we presented to them along with AE Networks, a history channel, about why don't we highlight the activists and the environmentalists behind the scenes who are really the real eco heroes, you know? They're the guys who are working tirelessly every day to protect nature. So, incredible project. It's brought me all over the world. All I have to do is research about, well, I do this anyway. It's what I love doing, just finding out about these people doing this work. And how do we and giving them a voice? So uh, we went to uh, the, the mountains in Colorado and filmed Eric Larson, a famous polar explorer, and we he brought us to Antarctica as well, and we filmed Antarctica uh, just earlier this year, and uh, we're just highlighting the work that these kind of eco heroes are doing, and you know, and indirectly then that's that's reflecting on the watch, etc. and. But, you know, when we were in the Antarctica, there was a record 20 degrees Celsius temperature. So, you know, I'm getting to see firsthand the impacts that are having. And, you know, I, I talk about it and learn a lot about it. But until you really see these things, you know, you don't really you don't really get it. And I think documentary helps that helps bring those those to light. So at the moment, we're creating a new one. And um and it's quite a story because literally three or four weeks ago, I should have been in the Galapagos filming underwater the uh, hammerhead shark migration. I film underwater, but it was all canceled because of COVID. So at the moment, we're trying to figure out how to work around that. We're using Zoom interviews and setting up cameras and bringing me into the film, showing how I'm making this, how I make a film. So that's going to come out soon. Um, that's exciting. Yeah, it's, it's that, really incredible. That was my next question. As someone who has to be there to capture it on film or camera, how are you handling the COVID crisis? Is it just a time to do research and prepare for when you can move around? So yeah, I mean, it's really been it's been a, a massive impact. You know, we we literally lost so much business. It was scary at first. Um, you know, some staff had to move on. It's It's been quite a tough, challenging period. Um, so we had to adapt to that, you know. So, you know, uh, we do a lot of animation and infographics and motion graphics. So that kind of side of the business took off, creating more content that's kind of infographic based. Um, we've had to think of new projects, pitch them to clients. We've had time to redo our own website, which was gonna go live maybe in a, a few weeks. Um, 
you know, we've it's you know it's been a wake up call personally and business wise, you know, and we've learned to let go of things that we thought we really needed. You know, we we still have a few brands that are not overtly unsustainable, but just aren't you know don't stand for sustainability core that we work with. So we've managed to let go of some of that business and realize, wow, we don't really need it. <laughs> you know, we can, That's great. We, can do, we can do better with sustainable ethical clients and do what we do and what we love. You know, that phrase, do what you love is so powerful. We're all afraid to do that. We think we have to give up on reality, but actually, you know, COVID gives us an opportunity to realize that that's just going to open up so much more doors for us. So, so COVID, yeah, been a big challenge. And I think on a, on a national scale, it's really helped Japan come forward you know, like in a massive steps. Working from home didn't exist. We all realized that, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're more productive. Uh, we're seeing our families. You know, it's really, I think, a great opportunity now for us moving forward, this kind of green deal this no business is going back to business as usual. Stop that, you know. So it's been tough, but I think for the future, it's been it's going to be great for for Image Mill and for sustainable branding. Wonderful. Well, that's it. That's our time. Thank you so is much. That an hour? I that's don't believe that's it. an hour. We're gonna have to have you back because there is so much more to talk about. Uh, we skipped so much. <laughs> we but, skipped uh, too much. Um, but I would love to get you back in a couple months time when you've got a new project that you're doing, when your website is done, you know, yeah. let's, let's reconnect. Yeah. Sounds fabulous. Yeah. Uh, great. Thank support. you everybody for all your comments. I didn't have time to fit in the comments, but we had a lot of support while you were talking. I did put it up on screen. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, join us again tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. We have Mayu Seto who is a singer-songwriter, who's also a peace activist, and she's going to talk about going to Australia, talking about the Hiroshima legacy there. So please join us tomorrow. Thank you so much, and uh, take care. Good luck with your business. I appreciate everything that you're doing. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you, and likewise, keep up the amazing work of, of getting the message out there. Thanks uh, so much. Awesome. Thank you so much.